You know, West Texas has a lot of goddamn Cretaceous marine sediments, and that's what we're standing on right here, looking at these beautiful desert badlands. Also got a lot of gypsum in the soil, as you can see right here, in a form of selenite crystals. See all that? Not a very hard crystal, dissolves pretty readily in water. West Texas also has a lot of very rare plants, like this one, this Badlands buckwheat, Ariagonum havardii. See, it's a perennial, just forms these little clumps, grows in these really tough environments. And then, right there, you can see this, the flowers. Tiny little flowers, tiny little shits, but enough for the pollinators in an otherwise barren area. So there's those tiny flowers. What you're looking at is an involucre, okay? You got like six flowers in that little cup right there. Look at how goddamn tiny those are. Look, barely, what is it? Whole involucres maybe, the whole inflorescence is maybe five millimeters across. All right, but again, you know, they're the only thing, one of the only things blooming out here right now, next to the chalopsis, which you get down there in the washes. Out here in the Badlands, they're the only thing. So you got nine stamens inside that tiny little flower. Looks like six or seven flowers in that involucre. And then of course you look at the, uh, the foliage right there. Look at that, just covered in the hairs, short little leaves, short narrow leaves, covered in the, the very stiff little hairs. Not gonna be too pleasant to munch on. And then you got a woody caudex, little woody root down below. Again, there's quite a few clumps. See, there's a clump over there, but quite a few clumps over there, but the only thing's growing. Oh, you got some yuccas over there. I guess it's not too barren. Surface of Mars otherwise. You know, the gypsum too. See that? It's still like, got kind of like a waxy, a waxy luster to it. All right? Doesn't, it's not too hardy when it uh, reacts with acidic rainwater though. Okay, we gotta talk about the geology here because the geology here, as you can see, is extremely bizarre and very distinct. We're looking at gypsum slash limestone badlands. Both are marine sediments. In this case, they're about 110 million years old, so they're remnants of an ancient ocean. Interesting thing, most people don't realize is that how closely geology is tied to plant life. In the case of gypsum especially, it can cause new species to evolve. Millions of years of growing on this very stressful substrate with very little actual soil and also very little rain because we're in a desert can cause new species of plants to evolve. And indeed, that's the case with the plant that I'm about to show you. You can see there's very few things growing here because of how stressful this geology is. A few things are growing on the washes, but almost nothing up top. This plant grows up top on the very dry ridges with the chemical and mechanical stresses of this gypsum habitat. Okay, now back to the video. Go fuck yourself back. Uh, greetings from beautiful West Texas. I don't know, maybe we're 10 miles from the Mexican border. You can see we're on some Cretaceous limestone at a uh, very superior swimming spot. Water's kind of coffee colored due to the chalky sediments. These uh, sedimentary bedrocks slowly weathering. Got a lot of, uh, appears to be selenite. Just a form of gypsum in the ground right there. And then coming out the rock wall above the creek, we got this member of the ash and olive family. Flowers are wilting because it blooms at night. This is Menodora longiflora, probably pollinated by um, sphinx moths, as many desert plants are, pollinated by moths at night. And then right here, we got a member of the buckthorn family, Zezyphus obtusifolia. Now it's Circumphallus, I guess, because Zezyphus is actually an old world genus. It is east side of the Atlantic, and it's the genus of... Uh, I think they call it a fruits on those jujubes, but it's an Asian species. It would be Zezyphus obtusifolia, which is a planted ornamentally here sometimes. We've got a perfectly good native one, as you can see. Photosynthetic stems, so it can completely drop those leaves in, a, in times of drought. And uh, basically just, just go dormant. Well, not dormant, but uh, drought deciduous. It can basically just go drought deciduous and photosynthesize through its stems. And nothing's going to eat it. Look closely at the stems you should be able to see some uh, lateral striations as well because in a, in a time see those see the lateral striations they're not that pronounced right there sometimes you can see them uh, a lot better but uh, you know in an area where a lot of stuff tends to look the same because it's, a, it's an arid environment and everything's convergently evolved uh, ways to get around being not on by herbivores those striations on the stem can be a good uh, diagnostic factor. 
Here we got a species in a polygalaceae. It's a member of the genus Hebacarpa. Chihuahua desert species, Hebacarpa barbiana. Same order as peas, but a different family. You can see that guy's just growing out the rock wall right there, growing right out the limestone. I wonder whose root this is. Oh, that uh, Vichelia up there. And then speaking of Vichelia, the genus formerly known as Acacia, I wonder which of the six goddamn species of Vichelia this could be. Probably Vichelia constricta. You see you got those little spines at the nodes and those yellow globose inflorescences. Little poof balls, each consisting of a few, few dozen flowers. A few dozen tiny flowers. There's such a cathartic sound to listen to that the sound of uh, swift running water. Going through the little narrows right there. See that you go in there, just spin you like a little washing machine. Just tumble you around. Anyway, here we go. Uh, member of the rose family in both fruit and flower. This is Fallujah paradoxa. And uh, you could see five five white petals. You could see many stamens surrounding that central gynoecium. You got many carpels in there too, so you got quite a few carpels. All right, trademark of the rose family. All right, carpels not united. Quite a few of them. So like if you look at a strawberry, every seed uh, represents a different pollination event. And you got many of them united in that fruit. So look at the underside. There's the five sepals, five petals. And now let's take a look at the uh, fruits or series of fruits. Each one of those little feathers uh, goes to a separate single seeded fruit, a separate akeen. So it looks like you got like 30 or 40 fruits in there. 30 or 40 different pollination events that occurred. And of course, when this is mature, those will be wind dispersed. They'll dehiss from that, uh, that uh, petiole right there, that stem, that peduncle, excuse me, and then just uh, go off into the wind and uh, land God knows where, and hopefully after a desert rain, germinate and form a new plant. Look at that, there's an Onothera already done you know they uh, flower at night evening primrose you can still see that stigma on there though see that just coming off to the side looks like it did get hit it did get pollinated there's a, there's all those withered stamens with their vicin thread pollen what come on let's go what are you doing why are you waiting over there you were just swimming and having fun what are you doing now oh member of the marigold tribe of asteraceae Porophyllum is the genus here. Known for the leaves smelling so good because they got glands in them. Semi-succulent foliage. Almost looks semi-succulent, but it does have uh, a woody stem. It's, you know, it's basically a little shrub. You can see discoid flowers, no ligules, no rays. You got, I don't know, it looks like 30, 30 individual florets. Basically just the uh, flowers that are part of that capitulum. Sticking out of that involucre right there. A uniseriate involucre. See, you just got one row of bracts, not two or three. Oh, it smells so good. Common plant, underappreciated in my opinion. Oh, you see that? It's a nice sound. You could put that, you know, some ASMR, uh, what is it, AMSR? How do you say ASM? What, how the shit you say? Whatever that stuff is, that abbreviation for the stuff that kind of puts you to sleep. Like, you know, a wave machine. You know, in the 90s, my mom had a wave machine she used to use to help her sleep. Beautiful muddy water. Got the bentonite glazing shit in it. You know, you could open a spa here. God, I hope you don't, though. If you do, I'll kill you. So we got four more days of rain forecast. Everything's loaded up. You can see how the muds, those calcareous muds, weathered out of the rocks, are a cracking down there. It smells really nice. This, this clay smells pretty good when it's done. Oh, look, there you go. What are you doing? There you go. Come on. You got uh, you coming or what? Yeah, just playing and having fun. I thought they were going to, you know, maybe, J I don't know what Jack's doing. Jack's a little, he gets a little worried. You know, he's kind of a fun cop, so he does have trouble relaxing sometimes. Look at that beautiful polishing by flash floods past. Wonderful architecture on these rocks right here. You see that? Oh, I love it. Oh, we got to drown the Kino Sirius there. Probably washed off a cliff uh, upriver, however far away, and then just got lodged in this little inkwell right here. All right, P. Cactus. 
Okay, so though we did get rain, there's still evidence that a drought and it's abundant. You could see, when you see the little beige cuticle, that's our friend Aerocarpus fissuratus, the living rock cactus. And that's what happens when they die. Okay, that tissue is normally green or there's green tissue underneath it at least. And what you're looking at is just that thick cuticle. All right, it almost looks like it's made out of chitin. It almost looks like it's like a little uh, like crab claw. And you could see that the hard material helps prevent them from drying out. And of course it would just be filled with the green tubercles that uh, that are just bits of the cactus stem that photosynthesize. But when they die, that's what happens. You can see more, more over there, more over there. There's one. So there was a healthy population of Aerocarpus. Oh, that guy's still alive. Look at that. That guy's still alive. And we got a nice, nice uh, money shot of his stem, which should be underground. So I'm gonna put some, I'm gonna put some uh, rocks around it. There's one that's still alive, as you could see. See, you got green in there. You got some green in there still. But uh, when they start to go, they start to go around the edges first. So you get that kind of beige coloration on the cuticle, and then they just slowly decline. But we did get some rain. That creek over there is running but it still doesn't comp for uh, just how bad the recent drought was. Can't even see this guy. That's how it is when you're hanging out with the Aerocarpus. You don't even see him. You'll be standing right on top of him. You don't see him till you look a little bit closer. You notice that geometric uh, fractal pattern. God, such a banger. And look at this guy over here. A multi-headed, these might all be individual plants, of the Echinocactus horizontalonius. I think they moved to another genus with a goofy sound, the name Homolothephala. They should have this on oh, some kind of interesting rack. What's going on there? But anyway, four of them. Little cotton tops right there. How about that? Oh, there we go. A kino series. Looks like uh looks like it could be a kino series Dasiacanthus or a kino series chloranthus. And then right there, look at a bit. You got another living rock. You got Aerocarpus hanging out. And a big old guy right there flowering in November with the pink flowers. Such a goddamn incredible habitat. Look at it. So look at this habitat, you got these nice little steps just carved out of the limestone by this creek. Of course, these limestone beds were originally laid down horizontally at the bottom of an ancient ocean 110 million years ago, but they've been dipping to the west towards the direction that we're flying, and as they've eroded and weathered, they've created what looked like almost like a little staircase that this creek is flowing through. Pretty incredible. Once again, we see geology dictating plant habitat and plant evolution. You can't have any of these plants if you don't have the habitat. This right here, this whole piece, this is the Bokeas formation we're looking at. Here we go, member of the nightshade family, member of the genus Lyceum. You can see just got axillary leaves, sessile, no petiole, spines coming out of those, uh, those nodes too. And then there's one flower, there's just one tiny flower right here, you can see obvious nightshade flower five petals all united forming a little tube lysium's a pretty big genus it's the genus of uh, goji berry we got all kinds of good rocks on the ground is it gypsum or calcite oh uh, it looks like it's a uh, yeah it's gypsum it's selenite nice crystal though I'll sell it in a rack shop you know just got to get rid of the sharp edges you know just round it into a little butt plug sell it online it's your etsy store and then coming up within that uh, spiny glaucous leaved plant, we got Talinum orantiacum, okay? A caryophyllid. Let me see if I can get in there a little bit. God damn it, it's getting stabbed. Little uh, succulent caryophyllales member. Look at that nice flower. Ah, lanceolate le linear leaves. You got a little uh, mid vein in them, too. 
So same order as cactus and beets and lithops. But, uh, and this is, uh, so far as I know, I've only seen this uh, out here in West Texas. <sighs> only a dozen or so miles from the border. This is a cool one. A. Chrysanthes and Gustafolia, member of the Bougainvillea family. Nictaginaceae. See those wings on that uh, little fruit right there? The flower's already done. Most members of this genus are pollinated at night by hawk moths, but this thing can get hit by a couple other pollinators. It's one of only two species in the genus to do so. So it's got kind of a different scent profile. A lot of these things got nitrogenous compounds that attract the hawk moths that pollinate them. So we got limestone over there, and then over there you can see we got some lovely volcanic badlands. Looks like rhyolite mixed with uh, tephaceous sediments, volcanic ash. And we got uh, right here a true desert willow, not the plant colloquially known as desert willow. That would be chelopsis, which is a relative of catalpa, which is also abundant here. It's got big pink flowers that look like open mouths. This is a true uh, willow, member of the uh, Salix genus, the Salicaceae. The order Malpighiales, same order as poinsettias. This is uh, Salix goodingii. You can see those are little fruits, unripe, that are about to open, and when they do, they'll look like that. Almost like an incense cedar cone, like a little duck bill, just uh, ready to vomit. Why, why do I always, why do I make it like that? I don't know. Got to make it a little crass, you know, drive away to squares. Anyway, growing here in this Aurora, who knows how deep down the roots go, because this wash is normally dry, and it's, you know, upwards of 110 degrees here. In the summer and of course here's the plant colloquially known as desert desert willow which isn't a willow at all it's related to catalpa this is chelopsis linearis beautiful flowers on it family is big noniaceae which you get all over the world okay kegalia africana is probably one of the weirdest members of it the sausage tree of that family but anyway let's talk uh chelopsis you can see got those hairs in there as well as nectar guides guide the pollinators in there make sure they come up uh their backs come in contact with those four stamens up top, the dynamis stamens at two different levels, and then you get the style right there in the center. You can see that. Pretty easy to grow. Used as an ornamental a lot, thank God. It's a beautiful native ornamental. There's the fruits right there. Still, you know, just looks like a, almost like a legume, like a little bean pad. And then look at this Thelosperma, a member of the Coreopsis tribe, which you could tell because it's got those colliculi at the base, those little bracts at the base. There's the phyleries, just a single series, and no uh, no daisy rays, so no ligulate, aka ray florets, it is asteraceae, just all disc florets. This is Thelosperma megapotam megapotanicum, but it's a putative hybrid with a species that grows further east in central Texas. It's got red florets. Look at those florets. And uh, the seed is at the bottom, of course, each one of those flowers corresponds, those tiny flowers corresponds to a seed at the base and a keen, a single seeded fruit. And uh, the whole flower, if I were to dissect that, just looks like a, kind of like a, almost a bowling pin shape, but it, it widens at the top where those uh, five red corolla lobes are. Real weird shape to them. Great species though. Wonderful perennial. And of course, here we go, A. Chrysanthes. This grows in a, as a weed in the region. Look at that. That's the floral, the floral tube. They're getting ready to open up, pollinated by sphinx moths. Look at how long that goddamn floral tube is. They'll be open in about an hour or two, open at night, pollinated by moths at night. You can see you got opposite leaves. Bougainvillea family, Nictaginaceae. You got the undulate leaf margin too, which uh, I presume to be an adaptation to minimizing leaf surface area that is exposed to the hot sun. Wonderful perennial, you can see, just boom, just going off right there. How about that? Okay, and here we go. You get this in South Texas too. Mean bastard of a plant, Cylindra punchuleptocollis, Tasahio, but it's got those thigmo nasty stamens. So thigmo nasty it is, or thigmotropic is a more appropriate word. When you touch them, it causes the stamens to move in like that. You see them? You see them moving? That's, of course, uh, I guess, uh, you know, meant, well, not meant, it's evolved to, uh, you know, make sure it encloses the pollinator, gets pollen all over that pollinator's back, dust them, and you got that stigma right there in the center. Don't want to get hooked on it. It does have the glockets and the barbed spines. Real fucking mean, but beautiful flowers. How about that? Now, I had to pull over and urinate, and this seemed like a good enough spot to do it because I'll take this opportunity to explain to you what's going on here. You basically have an ash flow. 
just basically volcanic ash, right? High silica white volcanic ash topped, it looks like, topped with a nice uh, icing layer of basalt. So, uh, makes for quite the, uh, quite a color palette. Looks like you got quite a few plant, interesting plants growing on here. We should go over there and botanize. Well, we're short on time and I got more interesting stuff to show you. So maybe we'll keep heading up the road. I'm done pissing now, but, uh, let's all have an appreciation for tefacious sediments. How about that? Oh, look at that. Okay. Macaranthra tanacea folia, quite common in the American West. Look at those distinct phyleries, little spiky bracts. Diagnostic for subtribe Macaranthera, a relative of Grindelia and uh, the genus Eurybia. Quite sticky, too. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, but look at those goddamn purple ligules. Ooh. 100 flowers inside that uh, capitulum right there. Look at, look at that. The scales, the glands. And of course, the uh, dissected foliage right there. Nice banger plant for uh, the North American deserts right there. Tahoka daisy. Oh, look, we also got a Hoffman segia. Oh, one of my favorite genera of goddamn Seisalpinoid peas to draw. Look at all the glands. Flowers are closing up. Brown stamens, 10 stamens in there, five petals. Goddamn sepals are curled back. Look at the glands. You see the glands? Like one of those uh, grow bros looking at the high times. Look at it. God damn. I've seen some really cool Hoffman Sega. Some really cool members of this genus in Chile. Ah, oh, just incredible flowers. Just wild, wild ass colors. And then you got those glaucous pinnate leaves. What a pea. And you got a woody stem. Nice perennial down there, huh? Come back. Definitely got to get that in your garden if you live in a region. Holy shit. Your old friend there, Serenia, too. What a nice brassica. Got your four petals, got your six stamens, got your keel-shaped, cupped sepals back there, alternating with the petals. See those little uh, green things in the back? Or I guess they're like a piss yellow. And you got those brassicaceous anthers, too. See how they kind of curl back like that? Saw that on the genus Heliophylla. Uh, when we were in South Africa, too. Ovary in the center, superior ovary. And uh, it matures into a uh, a little salique, a little fruit like that. See that? These are old uh, post-mature flowers. Petals and sepals already fell off. Common as hell, but always appreciate it. Oh, that's nice. Look, it's another one of those lyceums with the glaucous blue leaves. Those beautiful glaucous leaves. Flowers mostly done, as you can see. But it's a, it's got another one of those goddamn telinums in it that's smart growing in the center obviously not intentionally anything that didn't grow in the center probably got eaten but <laughs> eaten by jackrabbits but that's uh, you know utilizing another plant as your bouncer utilizing another plant for protection oh shit we got another member of the nightshade family just like that lyceum there's those fruits little inflated capsules you could see those are just sepals acting like a little paper lantern around that developing ovary. Those are just calices. Ah, just like you'd see on a tomatillo, the papery shit on a tomatillo, those are just the sepals. You got those little purple flowers. Quinquilla lobata, used to be in a genus Physalis. Let's see, just like many Physalis species, okay, aka the goldenberry, these are edible. You got that little fruit inside. When it's mature, it's edible. Look at that. Okay, now just before the sun sets on our ass, it looks like I'm going to get to show you this plant. Okay, one of my favorite genera in the Bougainvillea family, the Nictaginaceae. This is the genus Anulocollis, and it's in full flower right here. You can see those coriaceous leaves. Look, these are not soft. These are very leathery. You can see they got all those scales on the underside of them. Holy shit. Opposite leaves. This is uh, the genus known as a ring stem. So the leaves are nice. Okay, you got a lot of lot of gypsophilic species in this genus. You know, species that are adapted to the gypsum, and there is a lot of selenite in this limestone right here. You mostly get gypsum co-occurring with limestone. All right, but the real showy, the real showy shit is right there. Look at those flowers. Look at those long ass stamens coming out of that uh, corolla. Well, it's not really a corolla; it's a uniceriate perianth. So I guess they're technically petaloid sepals like many members of the nick tags but orange anthers look at that you got the orange anthers on there this is such an amazing 
I seen one of these species. It was a new Lucullus gypsy genus up by the New Mexico state line. I think it was in New Mexico. I don't know. We met some crazy redneck who was ranting to us about climate change and how it's not real. I don't know what his deal was, but uh, he was entertaining to say the least. But uh, I think it was New Mexico, but it was middle of nowhere and it was these gypsum flats. It was just barren white gypsum, kind of near white sands. It was the same stratigraphic uh, uh, structure, stratigraphic formation that White Sands National Monument is in. Look at it, you got the opposite leaves, another trademark of the Nictaginaceae. See how they're opposite each other on the stem back there? But this goddamn thing, I've seen it before, never seen it in flower. Not this species. I came here and it was just, it's a perennial, it was just hanging on. You look at it, look at it, goddamn, look at that perennial woody stem. Look at that, holy shit. How old is this plant? Huh? Just banger flowers right there. Look at that, God damn it. What's pollinating those? You got a nice moth coming by at night to get these or what? But at the end of the day, that shit don't even matter. Because at the end of the day, you're just looking at a fucking marvelous flower, okay? And, and a very cool plant that's evolved to survive and thrive in some of the harshest conditions Western North America can throw at it. All right? Pretty pleasant right now. Maybe 80 degrees. You can see we just got some rain, but it gets upwards of 110 degrees with like, you know, 10% humidity, if that during the summer right? it gets very hot out here that's why you got the coriaceous aka the leathery leaves you got the thick woody stem that it can die back to and you got that glaucous color with the uh with the farina the wax on it all right another thing a lot of members of the nictaginaceae the bougainvillea family have opposite leaves and indeed you can see those leaves are opposite opposite as opposed to alternate just meaning that they occur opposite each other on its stem all right, look at this guy right here, all right? Another night bloomer. Look at those long, white, tubular flowers. That tells you right there it's pollinated at night by hawk moths. This is Amsonia longiflora, a member of the oleander family of Pasanaceae. Look at how linear those leaves are, too. Look at that little floral tube. Just nice for, just, just perfect for a hawk to get its proboscis up in there. Look how long that tube is, too. So many unrelated plants have the same floral morphology, blooming at night because it's too hot to bloom during the day, so they're pollinated by moths. Another beautiful West Texas sunset. You got the so tall the Desilerian in there, and here we go. One of the uh, Texas sage species that isn't a Texas sage at all. It's a member of the genus Leucophyllum, family of Scrofulariaceae. Same order as sage, but different family. And this is a, a different one than you commonly see planted out in shopping centers in Texas. <laughs> this is a little bit more desert adapted leucophyllum minus you can see it's got the tinier much tinier leaves got some hairs on it actually they're, they're more like scale like trichomes but that right there that in the color will tell you this is a, a definitely adapted to a more arid climate and of course there's that bilateral symmetrical corolla with the uh the hairy petals Ooh, and you got all those uh hairs on the bottom of that uh floral tube as well and there's that uh, style little white thing sticking you can see it in there you can see the stamens in there too those little purple uh, lines look at these anulo colors god what a fucking incredible plant i can't get over it oh i'm intoxicated with beauty look at this guy look at it he may not flower this year <laughs> he looks kind of rough look at how thick that stem gets though incredible god damn that's wild Almost look like begonia leaves. Look at that. Look at the texture on it. Supposedly there's some caterpillars out here that the uh, undescribed species of caterpillars that this is their host plant. I don't know. It does look like something's been on on some of these. Now that might have just torn. Been torn. Nope, something was eating that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at, the, look at that root. That thick, stocky root. Jesus Christ. What a... What a cool species and what a cool genus. Let's go find that goddamn buckwheat. Oh, I see right there. Some weird, some weird little clumps. This plant, Ariagonum havardii. Such a cool one. Look at that. It's got a monopoly on the barrens. And why is it so barren? Well, you got some Desilerion. Had a couple yuccas back, the, back down away, but you don't see any of those vichelias, any of the mimosas. It's so barren, quite well, because it's hot as balls and it's super dry, but also quite likely because of the uh, chemical and mechanical stresses put on plant roots by uh, 
the element selenite. What well, the element gypsum, excuse me, the mineral selenite. But anyway, here's that Areogonum havarda. You can see just forms a little pin cushion. One of the buckwheats, family's polygonaceae. And I've seen this plant quite a few times, but I've never seen it in flower. Who knows how old that is? All right, again, you got a thick woody caudex beneath all these tiny rosettes of leaves. Almost looks like that uh, Azarella compacta that you get, uh, from, you know, member of the care family that you get up at a high elevation in the Andes. No relation whatsoever. I'm just saying, it does look, uh, it's got the kind of Azarella matte, you know, mound thing going for it. And then there's those flowers, all right? Tiny as hell. Look at that. You got the finger, uh, finger uh, centimeter scale right there. So 10 millimeters to a centimeter, of course. Which, uh, you know, even Americans should be able to remember. Uh, and uh, so that flower is what? Barely, not even that individual flowers are not even five millimeters wide. Nine stamens in the center. Uniseria perianth. Okay. And then you got them all coming out of that involucre. Looks like a little flower vase. Involucre is just a fancy word for flower vase. The petals uh, are uh, fuzzy. As you could see, this shit pollinates these. Something tiny. Ah, that's so goddamn cool. And it looks like you got like 10 flowers. Eight to 10 flowers inside that involucre right there, that little vase. Yeah, right, but even without the flowers, it's fucking incredible. And it's endemic to this region. Only grows in this region, okay? It's an endangered plant that only grows on these gypsum barrens. Speaking of endemics, edanthic endemics, here's another one. This is a Oreocaria, formerly Cryptantha crassipes, but it's not going off right now. I've seen it blooming before, it blooms in March, but uh, another endemic, okay, with, uh, again, looks like it, the leaves almost look like they occur in little rosettes. They're keeled, okay, can't duplicate. They're just folded in like that. Glaucus, they got the hairs on them. All right, look at it. Look at all the tiny hairs. That's what gives it that chalky blue color. All right, but again, not going off. When they do go off, you know, five uh, united petals, a little yellow. Uh, looks like a butthole, kind of, in the center of that flower, if I could be so eloquent. All right, make you shift in your seat a little bit if you're watching it with your grandparents or something. You know, but there's some sick fucking old people out there, you know? A lot of them are my friends, to be honest with you. Look at all these tiny little shits. See that? How old is that? How old is that Areogonum? Just makes you wonder, when you see the big mound, that has got to be, what, 30, 40 years old, maybe? Holy shit, look at that, just blends in. How old's that guy? Barely an inch in diameter. Look at that. Leaves just covered in hairs. And then we got our old friend Cobralinia spinosa again. Order of mustards, brassicales, there's those flowers. Four petals, eight stamens, photosynthetic stems that taper off into a very sharp and painful spine. And there's the fruits, little red berries indicating they're quite likely bird dispersed. When you got photosynthetic stems, you don't have any leaves to transpire moisture. It's gonna slow your photosynthetic rate down a little bit, quite likely, but you're not gonna be as efficient, but you're not gonna lose as much moisture as if you had leaves uh, either. And you don't have to produce a thick wax or hairs to cover those leaves. Though I do believe there's tiny little hairs, a tiny little velvet uh, it's too dark to get any good film quality. There's a tiny little uh, velvet on those stems. Either way, great fucking plant, only member of its family, monotypic family, Cobralineaceae, Cobralinea spinosa. There you go. God, you got a lot of good stuff going off tonight. It's about to get too dark for me to film anymore. Another beautiful West Texas sunset. Why would anybody want to live anywhere else? I've lived plenty of places and I'm done. Plenty of other places. God damn, look at those colors. I see those colors every night. Beautiful blues and oranges. Remember, gypsum causes speciation, much like uh, serpentine does, the state rock of California. You know, you gotta read about that. If you don't know about serpentine endemism in California, laterites, lateritic soils, sandstones, sand dunes, limestones, they all cause plant speciation. They all cause, because of the environmental stresses they put on plants, they all cause new species of plants to evolve. Gypsum's no different. You want to see the good shit, go down to Nuevo Leon, but uh, 
incredible habitat. All right, the habitat selects for the uh, for the plant's traits. And of course the geology is part of the habitat. Anyway, I'm rambling now, so you have a good rest of your evening. Hopefully you learned something out of this. Look at those beautiful layers of limestone over there. Holy shit. You got something out of that. If not, just some eye candy. Looks like there's a good thunderstorm brewing over there. That's all I got for you this evening. Have a good rest of your night. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Okay, it's starting to rain on my ass. Here's a pretty interesting plant from the Ilanthus family. Another one of the six different plants colloquially known as crucifixion thorn. This is Holacantha. This is in uh, Simarubesi, again, the Ilanthus family. It's gonna be, supposedly it's gonna be placed in Castilla because it looks a goddamn, which makes sense because it looks a lot like Castilla imorii, another plant known as crucifixion thorn, which uh, grows in uh, the Sonoran Desert. You can see the inflorescences are just coming out. They're not quite out yet but photosynthetic stems probably uh, leaves when it's young but no leaves later on looks like it tops out it's a it's a small shrub tops out at like two feet and uh, the substrate here is this ig igneous stuff but as you could tell by the lechugia it's limestone beneath you can see a little hint of limestone poking out from under there so that mountain is igneous and all this rock is probably just weathering off it the roots of castilla are in the limestone quite likely so but you know is it a specifist to limestone i don't know either way Marvelous goddamn plant and quite rare here in the Chihuahua Desert as well.